Uh, good morning, all. I'd like to introduce the subject of BYOD, or bring your own device, as uh, was introduced earlier by the Intel speaker. Basically, for those of you who understand BYOD at the moment, great. For the rest of you who don't, don't worry too much, because over the next two years, it's actually going to hit you like a freight train. This is something that's actually being driven by users in the marketplace at the moment. It's not something that Cisco controls. It's not something that Cisco created. Basically, it's a response to user requirements. Putting it fairly simplistically, what BYOD is about is the ability for a staff member to take his own devices into the corporate office to then use his own devices, not just for his personal use, but also for business tasks as well. So what you can see up on the screen there at the moment is a typical diagram of what that BYOD infrastructure needs to look like for a typical corporate environment. So the things to notice on there that are a little bit important, you've obviously got your office environment, your typical office environment. Top left hand side, you can also see there, there's the concept of hotspots, being able to do this from coffee shops. You're all familiar with doing that at the moment, fairly typical stuff. But the things that are actually going to become fairly interesting to us, the aviation industry, are the ones down towards the bottom there, and the area that we're going to focus on today. That very small piece of this that's actually called guest services. So what we're looking at doing is ways in which we can translate this corporate environment and this corporate concept into an airline view. So you can see on the diagram there, basically it's exactly the same. An airline corporation that has all the same needs for their own staff to actually be able to use their own devices within a corporate environment. But the key thing here is down in the bottom right hand corner there, the cabin network. What we're actually looking at doing and the work that we're doing with Airbus is exploring the concept of using that guest access within a BYD environment within the cabin of an aircraft. And so what I'll focus on now as we move forward is specifically the passenger as a guest within a BYOD environment. So what we're going to do is BYOD is a huge, great big subject, and I could spend hours talking about it, which I'm sure you'd all enjoy, but I'll step back from that. Okay, we're just going to focus on a few of the key attributes of BYOD that make it what we think is relevant to the aviation industry, and probably more importantly, we actually think that BYOD guest access could actually be one of the building blocks or the foundation of the next generation of IFE. And you'll see, at the end of the day, BYOD is nothing about the content that the passenger has on his device. Let's see that will talk shortly, we'll talk about media content, we've already heard words about applications and things like that being driven. The BYOD story is about the infrastructure that provides the secure and resilient connectivity to the passenger and obviously to the cabin on board the aircraft as well. So what we're going to look at here are a few of the access requirements. We'll then look at the experience that the passenger can expect as well. I'll put in technical architecture there because I'm an engineer and so I love technical architecture. So uh, that's the price you pay. Um, we'll then look at one of the single most important things, security. We'll look at the management of the system and then we'll look at the remote access. Because at the end of the day, What's evolving here is not just about watching a movie on board an aircraft, it's the ability to do business on board an aircraft as well. So the last slide will introduce a way that we actually think that that can be tied into the BYD story as well. Okay. So as far as passenger access requirements are concerned, what we want to do is we actually want to maintain some level of control here. Right now, if you have a look at the in-flight ecosystems that are out there, the airline actually controls those. They own them. They can actually decide what's on there and what's accessed on there. That requirement will continue to exist. At the moment, you can walk into a coffee shop, Starbucks, McDonald's, and you can actually choose to access anything that you want. Within the closed environment, an aircraft cabin, we believe there's some element of control that's going to be required going forward. And so it just so happens that BYOD can provide that element of control, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. On board the aircraft, what we're proposing is that there should be a single cabin network. There shouldn't be separate in-flight entertainment cabling and separate cabin system cabling. We're proposing that one network can provide all that functionality. And so what's critical there is that ability to actually segregate the passenger stuff from the cabin stuff. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Web-based authentication. What this is about is 
Every, app, every one of these smartphones and every one of these tablets that's out there has actually got a web browser capability on board. And it's that web browser capability that we actually want to make sure is the key starting point. It's the kickoff point through which the passenger actually engages within the BYD environment. And then he can access whatever service or application that we want to talk about beyond that. Um, overlay on the existing airline network. From one of those first diagrams that you saw up there before, what we're proposing is instead of the typical siloed approach that we've had within the aircraft in the past, we're proposing that in-flight entertainment should be seen just as another part of the IT system of the airline. Okay. Another thing that's absolutely critical there as well, different classes of service on board the aircraft, from economy through the first class, you need to be able to manage expectations there as well. You're going to have a large number of passengers within a small aluminium tube with limited connectivity who do you actually prioritise to? Your business passengers? Do you prioritise to your first class passengers? Do you prioritise to your frequent flyers? Who is the most important person to you? You need to be able to manage that. And within a BYOD environment, that's a standard capability. So we need to be able to translate those capabilities into the passenger environment. Okay. Next one down here. Uh, because you've got an element of control over what the passenger can see and do now, and you're providing the infrastructure, what you want to say to the passenger is, is, all right, we're going to give this to you, but there's going to be constraints on it. Classic example, you don't want anyone looking at certain websites when they're actually sitting on the aircraft, so you need to be able to control that access as well. Also, as we get into this, you'll see that the airline will actually be taking information. You'll be actually monitoring who's using what and what they're looking at. So you need to be able to tell people that that's part of the deal. If you sign up to using the service, we're going to know what you're looking at, we're going to know when you're looking at it, and we're going to have rec records for you. Obviously, that's a critical part of actually um, some of the reporting systems you have to do as well. <sighs> Logging and monitoring, obviously, you need to put, could produce audit trails. That's going to be an important thing that's required here as well. And last one there, desktop software. Obviously, the passenger doesn't want to have to do anything. What he wants to do is get on board the aircraft, he wants to open up his iPad, and he wants to look at something or connect with something. So what we're saying there is that this has to be very, very simple for the passenger to actually access as well. And again, guest access within a BYOD environment. You take your iPad into work, you don't want to mess around, you don't want to stuff around and make things happen. You want to open up your iPad and you want to be able to be connected, you want to set up a VPN, you want to access your corporate communications network. So there's a very similar, there's a very good parallel between what you do in your office environment and what the passenger will want to do on board the aircraft. Okay. Next one here, and when I was preparing this presentation, I actually, typical engineering approach, I prepared it, I thought it was fantastic, took it to some other people, they said, don't be stupid, Ted, you got it all wrong. You've forgotten the single most important thing, the passenger experience. And they're exactly right. Think about it. When you go on board the aircraft, what do you want to do? You don't, want to be, you don't want to have to do any configuration whatsoever. Again, it's open the iPad and connect and do what you want to do. It has to be plug and play. You don't want to have to down, necessarily download an application. Oh, damn, I forgot to download that before I got in the aircraft. I can't watch a movie for eight hours. It's going to go down real well. So what the system has to allow is that they can actually get into the system without having to do anything in advance. But just think about it. Maybe there's some value adds there. Maybe if part of that sign-on process or part of the frequent flyer process we actually said to them, well, here's a really clever app. You download this, and this can actually enhance your experience. You don't have to do it, but if you do it, we're going to give you something extra. Okay. Next one down there, splash screens. Okay. Every airline is going to have to have a different need for this. Perhaps every class of service is going to have a different need for it. Perhaps every frequent flyer is going to have a different need for this. So when they open up that iPad, what is it that they're actually presented with as well? So to be able to do that, part of the technology is we have to know who you are. We have to recognise you. So there has to be some tie between you and your device and who you are within the airline records. Frequent flyer, wouldn't it be nice to open up your iPad and say, G'day, Ted, you've earned enough credit points that you can have that movie for free. OK? So <clears throat> another key one there is going to be the administration of this. Traditionally, IT, every big corporation, Cisco, for example, we've got a pretty fair stamp, fairly substantial IT organisation that sits behind it. And if I've got a problem, it's dead easy. You just dial a phone number and someone fixes it. Okay? Most corporates are like that. But you're going to have 300 people sitting on an aircraft, and if one of them has a problem, you can't ring IT. It's just not there. It's not going to happen. So somehow or other, the actual onboard staff have to be able to manage this system very effectively as well. Okay? So easy administration by non-IT staff. And here's the controversial one. 
passenger network must be free or cost-effective and non-disruptive. Okay? What we're saying here is the actual infrastructure that you provide, the pipes, the secure, resilient connection, has to be delivered to the passenger for free. Just like walks into McDonald's, he expects to be able to pick up Wi-Fi for free. Okay? But what we're not saying is the content and the services that he gets delivered via this infrastructure is free. That's the differentiator here. Okay. I promised you we'd talk about the technical architecture. In Cisco, we've got lots of really, really, really clever and really highly paid engineers that actually get paid to do diagrams like this. So the downside of that is, is that I then have to use these diagrams that they do. But don't worry too much. We're not actually going to get it all technical. What we're going to do is focus on four areas of the services that that technology delivers. So we're going to dig deeply into the security side of things. We're going to talk a little bit about access control. We're going to talk a little bit about passenger services, and we talk about the management of these systems. But to do that, unfortunately, you have to sit through a few words on the technology. Okay? I'll try and keep it simple. Passenger device, we've already heard, they're evolving all the time. So what we see there today, two years ago, iPad didn't exist. What, six years ago, the iPhone didn't exist. What's going to exist in two years' time? I've got no idea. And as Intel said, you know, we'd like to think it would use a lot of Intel chips, and we'd like to think it would use a lot of Cisco networks. So it's going to exist out there, but we can't predict what it's going to be. And the message is exactly the same. The infrastructure has to be evolving. You think about it. How long does an airframe last for? What's it, 25 years for a good airframe? How long does uh, an in-flight entertainment system today last on the aircraft? Bigger figure, 10 years. You're going to put a good one in there? These devices are evolving every 18 months. You refresh your phone typically every 18 months in the US, sorry, 24 months in the US, 18 months in Europe at the moment. So what that means is the only reason you refresh is because it's a new model, it's doing new things, it's got new capabilities. So if your system that you're providing has to be able to refresh at that same rate. So what we're saying is that old siloed approach we don't believe is going to work in the future simply because passengers and you won't accept it. Things are going to change. Your phone changes. Your phone can do this. I can do this in McDonald's. I just want to do the same as I do in McDonald's, my cafe. When I'm eating a burger, why can't I do it on your aeroplane? So that's what's going to drive the need for this, for us to adopt a different model. OK, wireless access point. Um, it's actually, in an aircraft, it's a pretty complex environment. So from an engineering perspective, you've got a really big tube of aluminium. And in this big tube of aluminium, you've got three or 400 people. And every one of them now, if you're going to a wireless-based in-flight entertainment system, every one of those people at the same time wants to use that wireless access to actually connect to the servers that we've talked about before. And that's a huge problem because you've got just the physical limitations of the RF engineering on board the aircraft means it's really difficult to mount antennas, put antennas in place. It's really difficult to use, reuse Wi-Fi channels. So you've got a limited capacity there. Luckily, there's a big chunk of work being done around this to actually um, optimise RF, but also optimise the ability to be able to use wireless in a very constrained environment. <coughs> One of the places where we've actually done a big piece of work that was in the Olympics. You know, you're, uh, it's, they called it the first or the most connected Olympics that's ever existed. One of the reasons for that was, was that Cisco provided all of the Wi-Fi infrastructure across all of the venues at the Olympics. And the reason it was provided was to provide offload, offload capability from the GSM network. So what that actually means is Usain Bolt, just won the 100 metres, everyone's out there with their phones, they got click, 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 thousands and thousands and thousands of photos. And what does everyone want to do with them? They want to send them to their friends. They want to be able to share that almost immediately. So you, what you had was these huge spikes of demand for capacity at any one time. And so there had to be a huge amount of engineering work put in ahead of the Olympics just to be able to handle that massive simultaneous demand for wireless connectivity. And it just so happens that work that was done with the Olympics is exactly what we're talking about using onboard aircraft here as well. It's multiple simultaneous wireless connections. This is a good name. I love this one. Typical Cisco, identity services engine. I won't tell you much about that now. It's one of the three security components we'll talk about a little bit further on. But basically, it's about identifying you. Passenger wireless LAN controller. We talked about the access point. That's the thing sitting in the aircraft that allows the connectivity. 
But once you've got the connectivity, you've got to figure out what to do with it. So the purpose of the wireless lane controller is actually to manage how that connectivity occurs. And one of the key things we'll talk about there is it's actually used to segregate the passenger traffic from the cabin traffic. So we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Another fantastic security name, adaptive security appliance. It's really sad. The engineers that draw these diagrams, they also get paid to make up names. It's, it's a great world. Okay. This one here is something you're probably all familiar with. It's effectively, it's the firewalls. It's the protection from the outside world. We'll talk about that again in a second as well. Okay. Let's focus on security. Okay. As we heard before, one of the most absolutely critical things. When this new infrastructure is provided for in-flight entertainment and communications, there's an element of responsibility for providing security of this network, okay? So, first thing we're going to do is actually look at the, the wireless LAN controller in a little bit more detail. What it is, it sits behind that, that connectivity and effectively it decides which direction the traffic goes. So what it has the ability to do is recognise, is this cabin traffic or is this a passenger requesting to watch a movie? And at that point, it can actually decide which direction we take. And you actually handle things totally differently. And the whole idea there is to get it down to a single common infrastructure, but to provide security between the two, the two applications that are running on that infrastructure. I like to make things simple. At the end of the day, really nice box, lots of code, costs a lot of money, does a fantastic job, but all it does is separate the passenger traffic from the cabin traffic. Okay. Second one, I promise we talk about these a bit more, adaptive security appliance. Okay. It's the firewall. It's the one that actually provides the protection. So anything that you're trying to connect to the internet, we talked about security before, it stops people trying to get into your network. It actually prevents intrusion. It stops all the viruses and the spam, all the stuff you expect to have in your normal corporate environment at the moment. Okay? And again, nice and simple. It exists to keep the bad guys out. That's why it's there. That's its whole role in life. Okay. Identity services engine. This is about identifying you, the passenger, and what you're entitled to effectively. Okay? It also allows you to control, sorry, it allows you certain timed access. So, classic example here, we've got it shown talking to an active directory there. Instead of the active directory, that could equally be the airline booking engine. So it's your reservation engine, it's your ticketing engine or whatever. Wherever it is that you hold information about that passenger, okay? So you know he's gonna be on a flight from, uh, let's say, London Heathrow, across to LAX, he's gonna be on the flight for 11 hours. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna open a window of time in which we allow him to access the network. And the reason we do that is because you don't want him there accessing that network out of hours or out of that to. window. That and that's a part of the security, is actually limiting the time that he has access to that network. Okay. Um, there's also some elements of reporting and that built into this as well. But in, in reality, it's pretty simple as well. It's just about letting the good guys in. So you've got the two pieces there, keeping them out, keep, uh, sorry, keeping the bad guys out, good guys in. Just wrapping it up. We talked about three individual little pieces there, but security isn't about three little boxes. There's lots of companies out there that actually say, oh, we got the world's first fantastic firewall. Oh, right, right, play our firewall. And I'm sure there's others out there that do the same thing with that identity services engine. Yeah, wow, we can do that provisioning piece for you. But from our perspective, what this is about is an architecture. It's about a big view of security, what really matters. And within Cisco, another good engineering, actually, no, this was a marketing name. They called it SecureX. You can see, because engineers can spell, whereas marketers can't. So the marketers went for X. Okay. And basically, it's about doing all of that security that we want within an overall architecture. And the reason this is really important is because if you understand the overall architecture requirement, every one of those pieces that actually is in the system is evolving all the time. So um, there was one. Da, 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 da. One of those boxes that's actually there, struggling here, ASA. The ASA, there's going to be another release of the ASA that's going to come out within the couple of months, in the next couple of months. And speaking to one of the engineers, what it will allow us to do is actually dig down into what you're looking at and inspect right down to the bits and bytes of what you're looking at. So if you were looking at a site you shouldn't be looking at, we can actually recognise that site. We can actually do investigate the strings that actually make up the data and say, whoa, that's not good, you shouldn't be looking at that. 
And that's continually evolving. So as threats evolve, so too do the pieces, and so too does the big, big architecture have to evolve. So the real message here is, is this is all part of BYOD. It exists. It's there now. It's, it's a capability we have. Why not consider actually using this? If this meets the needs of the aviation industry, why not consider using it as the basis for, for onboard flight and flight entertainment in the future? OK. Network management. Go back to what I said before. There's no IT experts on the plane. Of course, unless I'm flying from Heathrow across to LAX. But generally, there's not many IT experts on the plane. So what that means is that you need some visibility of this. And what the proposition here is, is that in future, in-flight entertainment, if we make it part of the airline's overall system, what it means is that you've got to have visibility of the overall system. It's not just the in-flight entertainment system that sits on the aircraft that stands in isolation. It's now part of a big picture. Okay. And what we heard when Intel were talking over there, they were talking about servers. What's the relevance of servers? Who cares about servers? God, it's rubbish. Forget that stuff. Not true. All of the content that you actually watch will either be on board the aircraft or it'll be on the ground somewhere streaming to the aircraft depending on how connectivity evolves. So servers are going to be absolutely, absolutely critical going forward. Okay? And as part of that, you need to manage them. So what you need is some sort of visibility of this. What are my servers doing? Is everything that the passenger want there? Are they all working? Have I got the fallbacks? Do I have the ability to manage them? More importantly, you see that one down there? Compliance. Because you've got to remember, you're also using this for cabin. So you're using this to use, do credit card checking. So if someone's buying something on board, they're buying a movie on board the aircraft. So you've now got things like PCI compliance, the payment card industry compliance that you have to respond to. You've got one big network there now. So you've got massive problems potentially with PCI. But with something like this, it already exists. They've already had to do it. It's been done for ground infrastructure. Every bank, every shopping centre is using the infrastructure that we're talking here. They're using Prime to manage that stuff there as well at the moment. So why, why reinvent it? Network management, simplistically again, it's about a visibility of who is connected to what. Okay, whether that, connect, that is a crew one, where it's connected to a bank, or whether it's an individual connected to a website he should or shouldn't be looking at. The last one that I wanted to mention here, um, and this one here is specifically around business, doing business while you're flying, so particularly around VPN access. So it's the ability to actually communicate with your corporate network to do your job on the aircraft. There's a second thing in here, and that's why I've got two parts to this diagram. Within Cisco, for me to do my job on the fly, we have a little client that actually sits inside of our PCs. So somehow or other, we've got to overcome that problem. As I said, we don't want to have anything special on the PCs. Maybe we have to if they want to do business. Maybe they've already got it. But what AnyConnect does, it gives me remote access. But what it means is that if I lose the VPN, it automatically re-establishes the VPN. So I've got continuity of the work that I'm trying to do on there as well. So that's one piece. Highly secure business communication. Great, fantastic stuff. But the one below it, the ScanSafe Cloud, the reason that I thought this one was fairly relevant is as well as BYOD coming along and steamrolling us all, there's another thing that's actually happening in the industry out there, and it's called cloud. Not the big white fluffy things that you fly through. This is an IT term. And it's back to a, it's almost an old way of doing computing. It's where you used to have big computers sitting way over there, and they gave you the little bits of information you needed, right? It's gone the full circle. You had everything on your desk with a PC. You did it all here yourself. Now it's moved. It's all happening over there again, and you're getting the little bits of information you need. And if you think about it from an airline perspective, this is happening somewhere else. It's not a physical piece of hardware that's sitting on the aircraft doing it anymore. It's not a physical piece of hardware that's sitting in the airline office anymore. It actually exists somewhere else. OK, so that means I don't have a box on the aircraft. I've got no weight. I've got no power consumption on the aircraft. Maybe this is a better way of doing things. So part of the work that we're doing with um, the Airbus is actually looking at the way a different cloud service can actually be used as part of this BYD engagement to actually build a complete solution that actually covers the business side and we can use as many cloud services as possible. I think that's me. It's over to Lechik.
So I was asked to talk a little bit about ultraviolet and how ultraviolet ecosystem fits within the uh, airline industry. Um, so a little bit of background, and by the way, uh, I was asked to do it all in five minutes. <laughs> so I'll try to do that. Um, really quickly, one of the key things to think about from the media industry point of view, uh, why some of those movements, what's happening, why ultraviolet, is this incredible disruption in revenue sources. Uh, so, um, and the slide is not showing here very well the years, but if you look at this nice bump of the blue and uh, brownish uh, color that was around 2006, uh, seven, um, that's home entertainment. That's actually us buying DVDs, uh, potentially Blu-ray, uh, and renting those DVDs and Blu-ray. Uh, there was a period of time that actually uh, close to 50% of the revenue uh, within the media industry was coming directly from that. And actually for many movies, it, it would be even different. It would be even 60% plus. Um, and that started all of a sudden rapidly changing. And the reason it's changing so quickly is because that world doesn't work the same way anymore. We used to buy a DVD player, uh, one for home, one portable, then we had DVD players in our laptops, and we could just grab one single disc and use it any way we wanted. We could just put it into the tray and start watching. Uh, that changed. All of a sudden, there were all sorts of different online stores that were selling digital media. And the problem with the digital media was you couldn't carry it from device to device. Uh, you could only stream it to one device or download it to another device. There was no compatibility. There was no way of really easily reusing that media. And that world actually is changing even faster and faster than it did before. Um, we did a survey. Uh, we actually do a regular survey uh, around the media consumption, uh, some of the consumer preferences. And the amount of streaming is at this point already reaching uh, the amount of watching PVR in the US. Uh, we are getting that close to it. Uh, over 70% of broadband use subscribers in the US watch premium video over the internet. Not UGC, not user-generated content, actually premium. When asked about uh, which type of viewership they increase the most, it's actually streaming in the last two years. When asked again, which of this type of viewing you will increase the most in the next two years, 35% said streaming, 32% said PVR. So actually, we expect within this year or maybe next year, amount of premium video watched through the internet will be greater than through PVR. It's all about controlling it. They want to be able to watch it when they want, how they want, on their time, on their devices, independent of the sources. Also, what's interesting is how uh, tablets actually change that. Um, so, uh, Orala uh, publishes regular reports about um, internet video and what devices are being used, how people watch it, et cetera, et cetera. They have a pretty large uh, customer base that allows them to track it extremely well. If you look at it, it's really interesting how people stagger their usage of devices based on the type and length of the video. And that's something you will have to remember. It's, well, it won't be one, two, three types of devices fit all. People will have their tablets different tablets. People will have their laptops. And by the way, desktop, laptop here, that's what it means. Um, they'll have their mobile phones, different operating systems within those mobile phones uh, ecosystem. And they will use it all for watching videos and for other activities. Now, if you think about it from the business model's point of view and the kind of usage uh, point of view, there are quite a few different scenarios that we need to envision. Uh, passengers will be coming with their own preloaded videos on devices. Great. You don't have to worry about too much. They will be watching whatever they brought in. Um, then they will also get on the plane and they will say, you know what? I have rights to Netflix. I have rights to Amazon Prime. I purchased UV titles. I want to watch it. I have rights to watch it. 
but they didn't preload it. Is there a mechanism that you can provide that would allow them to do that? And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, there's another interesting thing, which is they actually will get on board, and just like today, all of a sudden, because they are on board, they have right to specific titles. The question is, can you extend it for some of them? So we all been there, right? They give us this nice portable video player that sometimes works. Um, we start watching the movie. Great, it's a long flight. We're flying over the Atlantic. Uh, let's see the second movie. Right before the end, they take the player away from us. We've all been there. The question is, is there a mechanism, is there a way for you to negotiate rights with the studios and other uh, dis and with distributors that allow passengers to finish watching that movie later? That they have, let's say, 24 hours to go home, go to the hotel, and actually log in, and that right is recognized that allows them to finish it. Similarly, what about them actually acquiring rights from you, either on the plane or even before boarding the plane? Um, you know, our, <laughs> our experience with airlines for a given flight starts quite early. We start thinking about where do we want to go, when we make reservations, we actually start interacting with you. Why not making a part of that interaction also uh, potentially acquiring rights to watch a movie or telling you, I want to watch this and this and this movie? At that point, you can preload actually when the uh, plane is actually at the uh, boarding area. You can preload the movie. You can enable that. And you can actually link some loyalty programs into that as well. And when you think about that, you know actually about us a lot especially when you will be providing entertainment the way we've been talking about, you will see what we are watching. You will see which movies we started to watch and then we, eh, I don't like it, move on. So actually, the amount of information you start collecting about our preferences would allow you also to additionally provide recommendations, even during pre-boarding time, during reservations, and then act on it. Also, a big change in this world is sourcing. All of a sudden, we have all of those different type of business models, subscription, pay-per-view, uh, electronic sell-through, ad-supported, and then obviously the captured type of viewership that uh, on the plane. And then you have all of those different types of contents, different release windows, and new sources. So for example, ad supported. Places like Hulu, Krakow, uh, Dailymotion, YouTube, uh, many different possible business models, actually including syndication models where potentially you can generate revenue. You can envision it even further where you insert ads based on your knowledge of the passengers. And yes, there are privacy issues, but actually there's a lot of work done around that. We are working, for example, with World Economic Forum uh, for the last year and a half, trying to develop new guidelines, how to create economic value from data, from consumer data, without at the same time jeopardizing consumer privacy. So all of that can be solved. I was asked specifically to also talk a little bit about ultraviolet. So, Ultraviolet, which initially was called DECE, -E, very easy to remember, which stands for Digital Entertainment Content Ecosystem. Uh, we rebranded it with the consortia, uh, and it's called now Ultraviolet. I think there are quite a few interesting accomplishments there. So first of all, it's unprecedented that Within this industry, we all agreed, and in particular content owners, agreed on common usage model. That's one of the biggest accomplishments I personally believe. Uh, forget the technical standards, they're important, but that was probably the biggest accomplishment. So when I, as a consumer, buy a movie, there's a token that goes into the rights locker. And after that, 
I can watch that movie on any of my registered 12 devices or streamed up to three devices, and I can share that experience with up to six people within my family. So that type of usage model actually creates many really interesting opportunities, and I'll talk briefly about uh, some of those opportunities. But in general, it creates very valuable usage model for pretty much most of the consumers. Think about it that all of a sudden you are not device dependent because that's a big thing. So I can buy a Panasonic device, I can buy a Philips device, Samsung device, and I can play the same title in this digital form by transferring the file using potentially different DRMs. And at this point, there are already five DRMs approved and there will be more. So from consumer point of view, it's like an old DVD. I just take it from device to another device and I play it. I just don't have to carry anything. It's all digital. Web-based account system, easy to use for consumers. Um, open technical specs. So actually anyone can use common file format. Uh, there are precise definitions how DRM is supposed to work. So all of that is available to everyone. There are multiple roles within this ecosystem, and I think that's interesting also from your point of view. Obviously content providers. I don't need to explain that one. Then there is a retailer. That retailer can sell that right to the movie electronically. So it can happen when I'm making reservations. It can happen when I want to watch the movie on board. It can happen later. So envision the scenario where actually there is a rent to own model. So I'm on the plane, I pay for the rental, I like this movie, I think my family will love this movie as well. So I can at that point change my mind and say, you know what, I want to purchase it. You apply that rental price to the purchase price, I go home and that movie is available to me and my family without doing anything special. Local access streaming provider, that's the role that most likely you would be actually playing. That's really streaming that movie based on recognition that I have rights to watch that movie. So I purchased it, I have rights, I get on the plane, uh, you easily recognize that I have that right and you actually stream it. And then download service provider, the name says it all. I bought it, I download it, I can move it from device to device. Interestingly enough, I did this use case scenario for ultraviolet three years ago. Um, and it did involve a plane already then. Uh, because we do think it's actually a very important use case. So imagine a situation, I'm going actually to the, to the airport, and I know it almost never happens that the flight is delayed. Just happened. So I'm sitting there waiting for my flight. I don't know how soon it's going to be actually, uh, how soon it's going to happen. So I go on Wi-Fi and maybe actually to the hotspot that already is managed by the airline on which I will be flying. Um, I am a frequent flyer, I have a ride, I get it for free, I watch it. Oh, yeah, I wanted to see such and such movie. I start watching it. I decide to either rent or buy, start watching it. I didn't finish, right? Because luckily I can board the flight. So I get on the plane, I can continue streaming at that point, and at the same time potentially downloading. The flight ends, I didn't finish the movie, I go to the hotel, I logged into the ultraviolet infrastructure, I can finish watching that movie actually on that big HD screen. So that's already with current ecosystem becoming possible. So figuring out how airline industry is going to play within that ecosystem uh, is actually one of the things that probably you will have to decide. And uh, this is too technical for me, so I'm going to give this to Ted. <laughs> As I said, I'm an engineer, so I like diagrams like this. 
basically what we've got here is at the top, we're actually looking at the business imperatives. Okay? This is what Cisco calls an architectural diagram. And down at the bottom, you've got all these various technologies. And if you have a look across there, there's stuff there. We've talked about servers, and we've talked about wireless network, and we've talked about ICE, we talked about personal devices. Okay? One of the problems that we have is most people, when they think about this, this subject, they're all stuck down there in that infrastructure piece. And they're actually not thinking about how that all relates to that very top level. So what we've done is we've actually translated that a little bit. We're not going to talk about the airline's big vision. We're actually going to talk about the airline's IFE vision. Okay? So that's about meeting the passenger expectations. We've talked about some of that stuff. We're also going to look at the changing the technical solution. And we've talked about the architecture and ways that BYOD could actually do that. But also significantly, Let's say we've talked about changing the business model. Basically, who owns the contract? Is it the airline and the provider, or the, the uh, content provider, or is it the passion the content provider going forward as well? So that's what we're exploring there at the moment. But I think wrapping up, in conclusion, what we think is there's some ground-based stuff out there at the moment that we think is relevant to in flight, the next generation of in-flight entertainment. We've talked about BYOD. We've talked about the content management distribution. We talked about SecureX, a little bit about the cloud. There's a whole bunch of other things that make this up. And that's what we're working on at the moment in conjunction with Airbus, is to actually look at how we can actually test this model in a real-world environment. And I think that wraps up what Cisco had to say. So thank you very much.